you have your Bible, would you open it to 1 Samuel chapter 18, and we're going to look at a familiar man in Scripture, and if you kind of have, if you're new to church, or you're kind of just interested, or you're, you're just kind of searching, what is this God, what is Jesus all about, right? Um, we could say, like, maybe spiritually, you're just kind of unresolved in wherever you may be in your faith. Well, there was this man in the Bible named David, and he's a pretty popular guy. But if you haven't heard of him, he's most popular, like the way he kicks off his story is pretty awesome. In the Bible, he, 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 he rose to prominence for, and, and if you've ever heard the, the statement, a David versus Goliath matchup, right? This is who we're talking about. A little context in the Bible, this man named David, he was a boy, a teenager. He rose to great prominence when he killed a giant named Goliath. Um, It's one of, I don't know, how many of you, like, I have some favorite stories in the Bible. David versus Goliath is just one of them. There's so many different things to that story I love to get into, but we're not going to talk completely about that, but we're going to mention this man named David. And however, when David defeated this giant, what happened was his culture began to celebrate him. Soldiers began to celebrate him. The people of Israel began to celebrate this young man named David more than they would celebrate their own king, which at the time was a man named Saul. Turn to someone and say Saul, right? So they were, they were loving the, the superstar. David comes into the spotlight, he slays this giant, and people begin to tell stories about this young shepherd boy named David. And rightfully so. This is an amazing thing, right? He becomes so popular that in 1 Samuel, let's open up, this will be our first scripture today, verse 7 through 9 of chapter 18 of the first book of Samuel, this was how they celebrated David. Are you ready? All right, WrestleMania night two is tonight, so I'm going to say, are you ready? All right, I'm, I'm into it. I'm ready. I'm ready. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. Well, little does Saul know that's very, very correct. But uh, nevertheless, we'll stick here at verse 9. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on this young man named David. David had all this popularity due to this This amazing feat that he accomplished. And when you read this story of David versus Goliath, there's so many things that we could talk about. But one thing, if you're not familiar with the story, is the Bible talks about the height of King Saul. How he was a head taller than all of Israel. Uh, Really, the king's position, it should have been Saul leading the charge saying, hey, our God's going to fight for us. And I'll take out Goliath, right? So this story, really, what Paul should have been saying to David was like, thank you. Right? Saul should have been like, his relationship with David would have been like, man, thank you so much. You got me off the hook, right? You think you just give him a thank you, a thank you. But there's this thing that always grows inside of us. And it, it really, it, 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 it's like if it, if it infects your heart, it, it has no place to go except to expand. And it's this thing called bitterness. Right? And that's what takes place in the heart of Saul towards This young superstar, David kills the giant, and what takes root is this thing that always grows inside of each of us. And when it begins to grow, it's very difficult to ever get rid of. This root of bitterness takes place, and Saul becomes a jealous king. He becomes jealous of a teenager, this young man named David. And it it grew so much that he eventually declares David, this is a lot of context I've given you, right? He declares David an enemy of the state. And instead of reigning and ruling and expanding his kingdom, instead of using his time and resources to govern people, um, Saul, instead of, right, instead of utilizing his, he he, he takes everybody, his, his army, his time, his resources, and he dedicates it to one specific task, and he becomes obsessed with killing this young shepherd boy on the run named David. He becomes obsessed with it. But God chose David. But how many of you, you, you know God has a plan, but you're not too thrilled with the time frame in which God's plan plays out? Right? 
I would think like David, David gets anointed. We know he's chosen by God to be the next king, but God's plans for David are a little different than what I would assume. I wouldn't think like 10 years on the run would be part of the plan. And very, that, very much so, that is what happens to David. It's about 10 years he and his, his men go out into hiding. First Chronicles chapter 11, verse 9 through 10, it says, the Lord, And David became more and more powerful because the Lord of heaven's armies was with him. Well, here's what happens is David begins this life on the run because the king is trying to kill him. And while he's on the run, the greatest soldiers... The, the, the men among men, the baddest of the bad, they start flocking to the young man who killed the giant. You're right, soldiers, they, they don't feel compelled to fight for the king that let somebody else try on his armor. But the soldiers in the wilderness, they begin to flock to King David and he begins to attract this large band of fighting men. This, this band of fighting soldiers Verse 10 of First Chronicles, chapter 11. These are the leaders of David's mighty warriors, together with all of Israel. They decided to make David their king, just as the Lord had promised concerning Israel. This man, David, kind of just fast-forwarding through this conflict, because we're not going to talk a whole lot about David, because he's a pretty well-known guy. Would you, would you agree? But I want to pull this out of Scripture today. David took the throne at age 30. Uh, the Bible tells us around age 70 he reigned. And so we're talking about a 40-year reign as king. And at the end of your life, after 40 years of reigning and ruling a nation, I would think, like, put us, put your, maybe you're 70 years old here today. What would you say about people in your life? What would you say about people who helped you along the way? Who would you point out? Who are some superstars you would look to? And, and so what happens at the end of David's life, the, the historians begather, begin to gather around the king, eager to talk about his triumphs, eager to, eager to preserve the king's memories, um, to, to get all of the history down, right? They didn't use paper back then, but to write down all of the, the history of this man's amazing reign and you would think right you think David would talk to his historians and he would want to talk about all of his victories all of his administrative skills after all he took tribes and made them into a nation David is a man that has a, a great resume to back up to write about there's a lot we could write about with King David he turns these tribes into a powerful nation and he could have bragged about all of the amazing things he had done and I think if anybody has a resume to justify some bragging, it would be King David. And instead, here's what happens. Turn your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Here's what David begins to tell the, the historians. Here's what he begins to write down. He begins to recall the names of some people he considered to be the real heroes of the kingdom. The real heroes that God surrounded him with. These mighty warriors that God blessed him with, right? And I think if we aren't careful, it's so easy in Scripture to overlook these lives all over the place of significance, even though we don't necessarily remember their names and we don't always recall their actions. I would say, man, these are some names of some forgotten heroes. And many heroes, we don't even see what their heroic acts were. Um, I didn't, I didn't have, the, I, I forgot to throw a picture up on the wall, but this week our eighth graders from our academy, and maybe some of them are here, they got back last night around 11 o'clock or so, but they had an eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C. And I saw multiple, multiple pictures of our students going along, whether it was the, the Korean War Memorial, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Atwell, help me out, what was the one where Kirsten was, found her uncle on the wall, just shout it out. The Vietnam Memorial, where there's just name after name after name engraved into these walls. Names that we don't necessarily know, but I would never say those names are insignificant. Right? And I love that our students got a chance to witness and to touch those walls where there's just so many people who made a sacrifice 
So we can enjoy sitting in church the week after Easter Sunday. Amen? Right? But if we aren't careful, it's so easy to overlook. And I think it's also so easy to let the enemy get a foothold in our hearts of helping us or making us believe that we are nobodies. And we're going to get into this a little bit more, and we're going to be talking about this over the course of the next six or seven weeks. But let's read some scripture about, you ready for this? this I would say, I, I liked parts of that show, Band of Brothers, and I love Saving Private Ryan. These are some original fighting men, Band of Brothers. You ready to read about these guys? Church, are you ready to read about these guys? Let's do it. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. Let's begin Look what David begins to tell people about. I'm not going to tell you about my administrative team. I'm not going to tell you about all of the things I did. Everybody's written enough about David and Goliath and how I took that giant's head. Here's what David points out. Verse 8, he says, these are the names of David's mighty warriors. And I don't even know if I'm going to try to pronounce this last name. Josheb Bashabeth was the chief of the three. Get this, David writes down, he says, he raised his spear against 800 men who he killed in one encounter. I'll, I, I just look at this and I go, this is beyond Medal of Honor type stuff. It says, with a spear in one encounter, this is how fierce this soldier was, right? Some of you, maybe if you served in the military, it would be very difficult, I would say, with modern machine weaponry, machine gun action, to kill 800 men, and yet David records this man did it with a spear in one encounter. Verse 9, and next to him was Eleazar. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines. Then the Israelites retreated. Look at this. Imagine this situation. They taunt the Philistines. It says, then everybody retreats. It's like, how many of you can't, like, has anybody here ever had a friend that just got exposed for their lack of, like, toughness, right? Sometimes, like, if you're in a situation, and, and it's like, man, sometimes you're like, you're in a situation, and you're like, I would not want that guy with me in a fight, right? And I think that's what happens here. These Israelite soldiers begin to taunt the enemy, and then everybody runs away. And look what happens, Eleazar. It says, the Israelites retreated. But Eleazar stood his ground, and he struck down the Philistines, it says, till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and then I love this. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Do we catch that? David's saying, do you remember that time where Eleazar took on everybody, he was so bad that his hand was frozen to the sword. Do you remember that time we had to pry the sword out of his hand because he just started taking everybody out, all while his fellow countrymen, his fellow soldiers retreated. But Eleazar stands his ground and the Philistines have no shot and, and things didn't stop until we had to pry the sword away from his hands. Verse 11, look at this heroic stuff. Next to him was Shema, when the Philistines band together at a place where there was a field full of lentils. Israelite troops fled from them, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. No wonder these men were friends of King David. These are the kind of friends you want. It says, he took his stand in the middle of the field and he defended it. <clears throat> He struck down the Philistines, and the Bible says the Lord brought about a great victory. And can I just insert this? I would say because of, not King David, because of this mighty warrior that, how many of us have even heard of this guy in Scripture? Right? I mean, I'm up here butchering his name, right? There are more and more heroes, and my point in this, in this section of Scripture, if you begin to just kind of Maybe if you want to have some alone time or study God's word this week in this scripture, there's more and more stories that David records. 
There's more heroes that he mentions, his mighty band of brothers, these warriors, these heroic stories. But a common theme is this, is that I believe they didn't fight for status. They didn't fight for some type of position in David's future kingdom. I believe they fought because they loved King David. They were devoted to David. I think they recognized his anointing. I think they recognized his calling, and they gave him the type of loyalty that you cannot buy. You cannot purchase. Maybe they sensed this God-ordained cause. Maybe these soldiers identified that, man, this, this soldier, yes, he's quite the musician. Yes, he's whatever, but he killed the giant. He killed Goliath, and yet he's still a man after God's own heart. I want to follow him. I think that's probably what they recognized, that heart after God, yet he still was every bit a man. We don't spend a lot of time talking about these heroes, these warriors, right? We, we don't spend a lot of time talking about Eleazar, Shema, these nobodies in scriptures, but church, all throughout the Bible, it's littered with names of nobodies, of unknown people that make an amazing impact on their culture, on their world. They make an amazing impact for God's kingdom. Would you write down, I have four traits of people of significance on display. And I think I, I, I kind of take some of these from the soldiers, some of these just from living, some of these from scripture. But if you want to be a person of significance today, and, and I truly believe, like, I remember being in, in, like, teachings in college where people would say things like that. And I, like, wouldn't raise my hand. I'd be like, well, I don't know. Right? But we think about it. How many of us here today want to be a Jesus follower of significance? Right? I would hope all of us, right? I would, like, without a doubt, we would raise both hands. God, I want to be a follower of significance. I want to do significant things for your kingdom. Well, here are some traits you and I need to work on. Here are some traits that I believe we need to possess. Four quick ones. You ready for them? Number one, I think David's men exude this, a selfless devotion. Like it's like any time on a good teammate. It's what makes for a good, uh, somebody you want to be around, a selfless devotion. David's soldiers were these high impact con con contributors. But it's interesting, in their time in the wilderness, it doesn't seem like many of them care who gets the credit for anything during that decade that they spent running from King Saul in the wilderness. But they play their part, they play their role, they fight with excellence. And what's interesting during these, these wilderness years, we don't really read about many complaints. We don't read about it, right, in these fighting band of brothers. Number two, quick ones, you ready for the next one? If we want to be people in, of significance and, and exude, right, we, here's the traits we need to have, a mission focus. Number two, a mission focus. What is the goal? What is the big deal? What is the big picture? What is the main purpose? High impact, somebody's focus on the right things. I think so often, how many of us are guilty of focusing on little stupid things? We just do. There's something in us, I don't know if we're overly blessed, we're spoiled, we're overly, well, like, we're, we're just, we focus on little silly things that very often don't matter, right? And I think, man, people of significance in Scripture, they focus on the objectives, the right goals, the overall goals, and they focus a whole lot less on their individual interests, their self-interest. Number three, number three, I mean, Jesus even talks about this, that we would be known for our love, but number three, a harmonious spirit with others. Would you write that down? Some traits that we need to strive and live for and act for. A harmonious spirit. High impact followers with Jesus. Can we say it like this? High impact followers of Jesus get along with other people. Do we hear that? <laughs> it's like simple, right? They get along with other people. And right, and there's so often, I think, I hear of stories and things in our school and different things where it's just these these petty differences are talked about, and I mean a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I think one reason we see, and, and kind of I was thinking about this, one reason I think D David's men, 
I would, I would venture to say they were more unified those 10 years in the wilderness. I'm just guessing. We don't, I don't know that this shows up in Scripture. But I'm guessing they were more unified in the wilderness and in the desert than they were when David was champion and king of all things. Right? And I think there's a reason for that because when these soldiers were in the wilderness, when they're out there trying to just survive, I think one reason we see David's men so unified, and think about this in our church, think about this in our homes, think about this in our life. One of the reasons we see David's men so unified in the wilderness is because they always recognized the enemy was right outside the camp. Think about that for a second. How often do we fail to realize the enemy is prowling around like a roaring, roaring lion looking for those he can what? He can have fun with, shake hands and play patty cake? No, the Bible says the enemy is roaring, roaming around like a roaring lion looking for those to devour. I believe in these 10 years in the wilderness, David and his fighting studs, his band of brothers, they knew the enemy was always ready to attack. Always waiting for them to attack. So we don't got time for this, these little problems, right? The enemy is ready to take you out. He's ready to take us out. Always, all the time, ready, ready to go. And so I think, man, they don't get into the, they don't allow their camp to become filled with griping and conflict and playing the victim and all these different things. Number four, what's the fourth thing we can do? I need to speed up this morning. Somebody say amen. There you go. Number four, and I think, I, I think about any great leader I've been around, um, any pastor, even sometimes a superstar, but they have this, write this down, a contagious joy. How many of you have ever been around someone that there's just a contagious joy when they walk in the room? And I don't care if the name of the person is, is Christy Stretz, who I love. Somebody said, right? I think of when, I, when that lady walks into a room, my attitude changes. Right? I remember one time I was at the Cosmopolitan and there was 80 people. And on this little stage, he was up there with some songwriters and Garth Brooks walked into the room. Right? And in that moment, I remember that room of 80 people just changed. There wasn't fancy lights. He had a ball cap on. There was something about his leadership. His, yes, he's a superstar. I was friends with this, this pastor in, uh, in college, and he's still pastoring today, and he's, he's just an amazing preacher. I don't know if you know him. His name's Chad Beach. And every time I've talked to Pastor Chad, there's just something contagious about his leadership. There's something joyful about his attitude, right? Would you write this down? High impact followers of Jesus bring joy into the atmosphere around them. They don't bring Eeyore into the atmosphere. And that's what we do, right? Because we're worried about ourselves, right? I've never seen a great leader. I remember being in a room with our, our president of our Four Square Movement, President Randy Remington. The minute he walks in, the atmosphere just changes, right? It, it, it's something I, I think about. If I look at these four, and what, maybe we'll get to this, I think, man, that, that's the one I feel the Holy Spirit tells me I need to work on that number four. Our unity, our humility, right? A joyful person, would you write this down, rarely leaves the room the way they entered it. A joyful person rarely leaves the room the way they entered it. And I have a challenge for us this morning. Here's the challenge. You ready for it? Would you write this down? If you're here this morning and you feel insignificant, if you're here this morning and there's something in, inside you that feels a little bit unseen. Um, if you're here this morning and you feel like, you know, I'm just lacking in like, I, I, I just don't, I, I feel like I want more friends, but I don't have a lot of friends, right? If you're here this morning and, and you feel any of those different ways, I want to really actually challenge you. And I think the Holy Spirit wants to challenge you today. I want to ask him, ask the Holy Spirit, how many of these traits do you possess? Ooh, that hurts, doesn't it? Ouch! I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, how many of these traits, selfless devotion, mission-focused, harmonious spirit, contagious joy, how many of these traits are on display in your life? 
right away the truth of the matter. Like, can you answer that today? You don't need to tell your spouse, right? Just write it down, write down your, how many traits. I feel like the Holy Spirit just speaks to me right away. Like, Joey, you need to work on your joy. I feel like right away I feel him convicting me of that. The truth of the matter is, right, if you are feeling insignificant, unseen, lack of friendships, relationships, lacking, I, I would guess here's the hard truth we don't want to look in the mirror and understand or realize today, is that if we feel this way, you're probably lacking in a few of these areas, if not every single one of them. Holy Spirit, I think, man, God help me to have more contagious joy. I can't tell you, I mean, it's, it's like a reoccurring theme in my ministry life is people are like, man, you're really cool once I got to know you. <laughs> right? And then they're like, and then the, the reoccurring comment I get too is like, man, you don't hug the way Pastor Greg does. <laughs> right? And now that's, I, I, God, like we are different people, we're different leaders, but there is something habitual that is spoken, right, that I think of like, man, you're really cool when I get to know you. That's a nice way of saying is, Man, when I first met you, you kind of came across like a jerk. Right? You got like a, a face that doesn't smile. Some of you are like, yeah, I did think that about you. Right? Now the guilty laughs. Like, oh, yeah. Right? But I think of that. Like the Holy Spirit's clear. Like, Joey, you need to constantly, it doesn't matter that you're 41. You need to work on your joy. Is your joy contagious when you walk into an atmosphere? Well, as we get ready to close this morning, here's a quick story. And, man, I need to, I need to get going. But uh, as we set up this series called Nobodies, um, I want to give us a quick story that can show us the impact a nobody can have. Here's the impact a nobody can have. Let's read about it in the book of Acts. Dr. Luke writes this down, chapter 23, verse 12. And I'm going to kind of, um, I may skip through some of this, but let's read what we can because we got to go. Amen? Verse 12. The next morning a group of Jews got together and bound themselves with an oath. Not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Now, context here, this is the Paul, the Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary we have ever known or seen, the Paul that was converted on the road to Damascus. His name was formerly Saul. He was such a religious guy, right? He had that Darth Vader conversion. I love the Apostle Paul. This is who Luke is talking about. These men say, we aren't going to eat or drink anything till we assassinate Paul. We've got to shut him down and shut him up. Verse 13, there were more than 40, me, 40 of them in the conspiracy. They went to the leading priests and elders and told them, we've bound ourselves with an oath to eat nothing until we've killed Paul. So you and the high council should ask the commander to bring Paul back to the council again. Pretend you want to examine his case more fully. We will kill him on the way. And here we go, but verse 16, but Paul's nephew, his sister's son, heard of their plan and went to the fortress and told Paul. Paul called for one of the Roman soldiers, officers, and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something important to tell him. And, and part of this is because Paul was a Roman citizen. So you are not allowed to assassinate a citizen of Rome. There is a pecking order, and you don't mess with Rome's people. Verse 18. So the officer did, explaining, Paul, the prisoner, called me over and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took his hand, led him aside, and asked, What is it you want to tell me? Paul's nephew told him, Some Jews are going to ask you to bring Paul before the high council tomorrow, pretending that they want to get some more information, but don't do it, the young man said. There are more than 40 men hiding along the way, ready to ambush him. They have vowed not to eat or drink anything until they've killed him. They are ready now, just waiting for your consent. The commander replies, verse 22, don't let anyone know you told me this. The commander warned the young man in verse 23. Then the commander called two of his officers and ordered, get this, I love the, I'm guessing these 40 men backed off real quick. Get 200 soldiers ready. Leave for Caesarea at 9 o'clock tonight. Oh, and you're not, you don't just need 200 soldiers. Also take 200 spearmen, 70 mounted troops, and provide horses for Paul to ride and get him safely to Governor Felix. Now this is one of those stories that we could just simply skip over, right? It is. I know I've read it and I'm like, I know I've read it and I kind of just didn't think much of it. But Paul lives another day in this season of his life because of this young man, this young nephew. He gives some tips to the Roman commander and he says, hey, they're out to kill Paul. 
Church, do we even realize what a hero this nephew is? But you know what stands out to me? Is for some reason, Dr. Luke doesn't even feel it necessary to mention his name. He's known as the nephew. He doesn't even get name dropped in the Bible. He saves Paul's life in the gospel. He, we, we never even know his name, church. Amazing. If this nobody didn't take action, right? Think about this. The ministry of Paul could have, it could have ended well before letters were written to the Ephesians. Letters were written to the Philippians, the Colossians. No letters to Timothy, no letters to young Titus, right? And I think this is what I want to just kind of put on our hearts over the next few weeks. Church, success in God's kingdom, success in the local church, success in what we call the Great Commission, go into all the world. It depends on faithful people simply being faithful people, even if that means the general public will never know your name. Think about this young man. He was faithful in this small thing. Paul lives to write more letters from prison. These 40 men, these assassins who took this oath to kill him, they didn't get him because of this young hero. And we don't even know his name. The public never knows his name. And I think even in church, there is a natural tendency, isn't there? There's a natural tendency to be like, well, I go to Greg Massonary's church. I go to Judd Wilhite's church. There's this natural tendency we have where it's like we platform popular people. We just do. I go to Benny Perez's church. I've had many, right? And there's something in us. It's like we just, we, the movies and it, it's, it's celebrated by performance, whatever. I'm knocking. I love the amount of YouTube sermons we can go listen to. But there's something in us that, man, even though we're worshiping and singing about the name of Jesus, even though we're teaching about the name of Jesus, there's something in us that gives attention and focus way too much to people there's something in us that gives praise like it's like public praise stays with people and it's it's too much and i would say it doesn't mean we just stop preaching it doesn't mean we stop being a worship team or whatever it is but we always need to be cautious of god what do you want your church family to be about god what do you want church to be about would you write this down as we close this morning I think church needs to be about a gathering of nobodies coming together to celebrate and worship the only real, true somebody. Amen? Right? It needs to be like a a sense of humble nobodies gathering together with one purpose in mind, and that is just lifting up, celebrating, speaking, doing what we're doing today, just talking about the only real somebody whose name is Jesus. We celebrated him last week. The head of the church, the king of kings, the creator of everything, the one who we celebrated because the Bible says, yes, he died, but he crossed over from death to life, right? We could say Jesus, the only one who came back, the one who's now seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. That is who we gather. That's what the church, that's like the simplest thing that we need to be about because Jesus is the only one who was perfect. Jesus is the only one who has so much mercy. He's just. He's the holiest of holy somebodies. But here's what I kind of can't help but think about as we close. If the only real somebody died for nobodies like us, what does that make us? Think about that. Like there is that sense. We need to have that humility recognizing, you know what, I am in the grand scheme of this gigantic world. Like my life is like a dust. It's just a glance. I'm old all of a sudden. I am a nobody. But there is also comfort in realizing God sent his son to the cross for nobodies like you and like me. And he died for nobodies like us. And because the only somebody died for nobodies, what does that make us? It shows us, it, it shows us God's estimation and value of you and me. Whether we want to admit it or not, God's estimation and value of us. He, he decided to sacrifice the only real somebody. And I would say like this, church, that makes us very significant. 
And that makes our role very significant. And that makes our assignment very significant. So the question as we close is, what are you going to do with this significant role or assignment that God has given us to play? Amen? Let's bow our heads. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in, in your house. God, I, I thank you for those that are here today. God, thank you for those that are watching online today. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just speak into our situation. I believe you already have been. Help us realize an area of our lives where, Holy Spirit, help us realize an area where maybe we've been feeling insignificant. Maybe we've been feeling unseen. And, and while there is some truth to that, to a degree, each of us are in some ways insignificant, but you sent Jesus for us, showing our value, showing our worth, showing our very significance. God, your son has made us significant. And so God, in a world where people, God, each of us are guilty from time to time of, of wanting to make a name for ourselves. Wanting to make our own name great. But Holy Spirit, help us to lift up the name above all names. Lord, help us to fight the urge to make idols out of people, out of positions, out of bosses, out of stars, out of spot, whatever it is. God, help us to fight that urge. Lord, help us to live by the truth that you declare in your word. Encouraging people being active in the gifts you've just bestowed, you've given, you've blessed us with. Maybe you're here today just running through life thinking your, 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 your time doesn't really matter. But I just want to, as with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we're going to pray and say amen in just a minute. But I just want to tell you and encourage you that that one conversation you might have today with somebody matters. That one conversation that is an interruption this week that you have with somebody. Church, it matters. Paul was able to continue on in ministry because this young nephew, we don't even know his name, he spoke up and he said, hey, there's 40 people out to get him. So I just want to tell you, your, your conversations matter. That, that one word of encouragement that you might need to text somebody right now Maybe there's somebody here, you're like, you need to encourage someone with a text message right in the middle of this prayer. Heck, I'd give you permission to do it. You could lift your eyes, pull out your phone, and just start texting somebody if the Holy Spirit gives you a name, right? But I want to tell you, your encouragement into somebody's life matters. That one lunch that you take someone out to, that lunch you bought matters, that gas of, that tank of gas or fuel that you bless somebody with, that lady with, it matters. Those acts that church is full of people who really do a lot of serving in secret with our heads bowed and our eyes closed I just want to encourage you to say those ways which you have served in secret it matters and God we don't need our name to be known but help us to continue to make the greatest name known as we start this new series called nobody's God, help us focus on the greatest name, the greatest somebody, Jesus. And help us be a people and a community and a church that make the name of Jesus known more and more. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Can we all say amen? Can we all say amen? Amen.